Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel here on uh, ThinkTech, and this is our uh, Mina, Marco, and me show. Except this time we're doing it on Thursday at 4 p.m. And guess what? It's not 4 p.m. in China because that's where Marco is. Hi, Marco. Well, a very warm ni hao, Jay, on this very cold day in Shanghai. It's about mid-30s outside, but after a handful of days of no sun and dense fog, I can actually see the sun. So that is a glorious time, and it's actually Inauguration Day here, Hawaii time, although you have to wait a bit longer until the 45th president gets sworn in. Ah, yes. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the intersection of Donald Trump and Xi Jinping. You know, the Donald Trump started by taking that telephone call from uh, Taiwan and created consternation in the process. And Xi Jinping responded with some of his own posturing, uh, including uh, the aircraft carrier in the Straits of Taiwan. But, you know, what does he say? And then he went to Davos and made some interesting statements about uh, China's, um, you know, advancements and comparing uh, China and Donald Trump. So where is he and where is China about Donald Trump? Well, in terms of bilateral relationships, uh, I continue to believe strongly that there's no more important uh, bilateral relationship on the planet between, than between the uh, United States of America and the People's Republic of China. And I think that's a, a focus uh, that uh, the outgoing President Barack Obama rightly put the importance uh, and the effort and energy put into that relationship. So now it's a whole new ball game, and I think uh, Mr. Mr. Xi Jinping is trying to position himself. And he, he made his debut visit to the uh, the hoity-toity confab in Davos, Switzerland, over the past days. That he's positioning himself to be the the champion of uh, free markets, liberal trade, and globalization, and He's been getting a tremendous amount of press here, uh, both in the print and the electronic media, in terms of his remarks in Davos. And uh, to what extent uh, the relationship between the People's Republic of China and the U.S. is going to go south in a big way, of course, remains to be seen. I'd say one of the absolute paramount core interests in terms of China vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world is, of course, the status of Taiwan. And when um, President-elect Trump, soon to be President Trump, noted publicly that he didn't, did not necessarily ascribe to the so-called One China policy, which has existed since Jimmy Carter 1979, that is about the, the most threatening thing that any political leader in the world can say, uh, threatening in, in terms of being perceived by the Chinese as a threat. So to what extent he, he is positioning himself, Trump is positioning himself to get the attention of the Chinese and that anything less severe than, than rethinking the one China policy uh, turns out to look moderate by comparison, I don't know. I mean, so much remains to be seen. But, I mean, clearly the Chinese, as is rest, much of the rest of the world, is, is very uh, anxious to one degree or another and nervous to one degree or another in terms of how the actual policies are going to play out under the 45th president. Well, let's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, let me, let me just uh, offer a thought and see if you agree. Um, the Davos uh, comments um, and his response, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly measured response to Donald uh, Trump's maneuvers, um, seems to me to be really smart because he's not playing to Donald Trump. I think he knows he can't, uh, you know, either convince or intimidate Donald Trump. What he's doing is he's garnering support from around the world. He's taking advantage of Donald Trump's, uh, you know, bad reputation and bad acts um, in order to, uh, you know, uh, raise up China's uh, image around the world so that it's an opportunity for him to improve China's position, and he's taking advantage of it. I think he's doing it more for that reason than to, you know, engage with Donald Trump. I would largely, largely agree with that. Something I've pondered as of late, Jay, being the uh, international relations scholar that I am, I mean, that was my focus as I was getting my PhD in political science, mm -hmm. is uh, you have, we have had essentially something of uh, a hegemon uh, or dominant leader 
since roughly 1945. I mean, it's been the U.S., which emerged from, from World War II as the most dominant country on the planet in so many different uh, regards. And now here we're, what, 70-plus years later, and there would appear to be something of a changing of the guard. And, of course, no country can remain on top forever. I mean, historically we know that to be true. But the post-World War II international structure, so to speak, has been dominated by institutions and norms that were largely pushed and established by the United States and other Western European countries. And if that foundation is, in fact, crumbling, and you know, recall what Donald Trump said about the UN seven or ten days ago, called it essentially just a, a bunch of people talk, talk, talking and not doing anything. In other words, he was very derisive about the UN that if, in fact, the U.N. model and all the norms and institutions and intergovernmental organizations, as well as the NGOs, non-governmental organizations associated with the U.N., if, in fact, they are in the decline, then the big question is, what comes next? What comes next? And you can complain, as a lot of people do, and I have as well, about the, <clears throat> the lack of American leadership or the lack of foresight at times of American behavior. But we as the hegemon have been willing to bear a substantial amount of the cost to maintain this structure. And the big question I have for the Chinese is, are they willing to step into that breach and bear the cost that a hegemon must necessarily bear as well? And that, of course, remains to be seen. I mean, to some extent, Beijing has been practicing a superbly successful game of what I call uh, checkbook diplomacy over the years. They have a substantial amount of money, the largest amount of foreign reserves on the planet, and they've been able to be very generous in different parts of the world in terms of infrastructure projects, outright grants, cheap loans, and so forth. But that's a big difference between what they've been practicing and what would be required of a new global leader if, in fact, <clears throat> we're changing from a American-centric model to a Chinese-centric model. I mean, this is all, of oh, yeah. course, rather speculative. Uh, I, but, no, I agree know, we'll with see. you. I, I, you know, like when he puts down the United <clears throat> Nations, and when he goes isolationist, he's giving up the hegemony, um, and he's he's uh, by by pulling in, and in turning inward, um, badly by turning inward, uh, then he's capitulating to China's uh, in, initiative to become more of a world power. And at that point, and here's a thought for you, Marco, does it really matter whether China steps into the, the checkbook role at the United Nations? Is the United Nations that important to China? Maybe not, because China has been very effective in exerting influence economically and politically around the world. I mean, just think of the, the example of CCTV. <clears throat> Three years ago, CCTV was only within China. Now look, it's everywhere, except the U.S., and, and so it can exert a lot of influence in so many ways. Does it really need the United Nations? It might be better off without the United Nations. So it's a choice that they can make. <clears throat> Xi Jinping can decide to fund the United Nations and step into the role that the United States was playing, or he can abandon it and play the role of, um, you know, of the leader without the United Nations. Don't you think? He's really in a catbird seat right now. Well, a number of scholars, including one I have a lot of respect for, a fellow uh, based in Washington, D.C., by the name of David Shambaugh, who has written a lot about China over the decades he's been in the field, he has observed, and I think he's accurate in this sense, he's observed that the Chinese have had a rather schizophrenic relationship with these Western-based organizations, norms, and institutions that, to some extent, it's allowed them access to the world market and for them to be able to have this just beyond phenomenal unprecedented economic growth year after year after year but at the same time they have had a deep suspicion of, of said organizations and said norms and values so it has benefited them undoubtedly to be to have entered into the structure the model that has been dominant for decades but at the same time they've been kind of chafing against it as well. And, and here's one concrete example of which they've actually taken action. Several years ago, they established kind of a rival to the World Bank uh, as in the form of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or AIIB. 
and this is only now kind of getting off the ground in terms of having made tangible loans, but this is uh, an, an example of Beijing having not just talk the talk, but walk the walk in terms of putting together an infrastructure and having quite a few countries buy in, although not the Japanese nor the Americans, but you know, a source, having a source of money for infrastructure projects uh, gives them, and it's based uh, here in, in Beijing, or not, in Be not here in China, but in China, gives them a, a role that they previously didn't have. So it's truly going to be fascinating to see how this relationship develops between a Chinese leader who we have a high degree of certainty is going to be around until at least 2022, if not longer, and uh, President uh, Trump, soon to be President Trump in the hours to come, who uh, will be in office uh, at least four years unless something dramatic happens otherwise. So we're really... You know, we're really in uncharted waters here, Jay, and uh, uh, we'll see where, where we end up. Yeah, well, let me ask you this, though. We, <clears throat> we can't leave the subject until we discuss the, uh, the, the role and the reaction of the man in the street in China. I mean, first on Xi Jinping, uh, you know, who some people feel, you know, is pretty hard-nosed and who, you know, has, has taken this corruption uh, track of his too far. Um, and has punished too many people in too many ways to be popular. And other people feel, well, no, he's doing a good job, you know, internationally, uh, especially now in the vacuum created by Trump. Uh, and, and they like him for that. So you're there, you're on the ground. Is he popular? Is he not popular? What do you hear? Well, let me, let me address that a little bit in historical terms. Since uh, what happened in 1989 in Tiananmen and the dramatic dramatic events of, of that very turbulent and, and violent time. The argument observation has been made, and I very much agree with it, that the Communist Party here, which has been in existence since the beginning of the 1900s, has essentially pivoted away from traditional Marxism, Leninism, Maoism to one, uh, an ideology essentially based on nationalism, the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. And above all, Mr. Xi, I believe, is not seen as, although he's leader of the Communist Party, he is seen first and foremost as a nationalist and someone who is absolutely committed to continuing to lead China to the buffet table to get its rightly placed at the, uh, rightly placed at the buffet table in terms of world influence and, uh, and its, uh, uh, exercising its, its, its clout. So... Because of that, if one were to do independent polling, which is difficult to do here, but if one were to do it, I have no doubt whatsoever that the large, large majority of Chinese polled, probably easily in the 80-plus percent range, 80 to 90 percent range, would say that they are very much supportive of Mr. Xi Jinping's efforts, and they think of him as a very good leader, a very dynamic leader. And he's also the first leader, by the way, interestingly, Jay, to actually put his wife, who is a who is a rock star, literally in her own way, in her own uh, in her own uh, light, uh, Peng Liyuan, who is uh, the first Chinese uh, the, the the first Chinese first lady to really take a public and prominent role, and I think uh, the vast majority of Chinese are very very pleased to see the first lady of China so prominent. She's very attractive. She's very elegant. She's very well spoken. She is a uh, a, a singer. Of, of national uh, repute and was quite famous, in fact, before she even married Mr. Xi Jinping. Mm. So, uh, to, you know, to answer your question, I think he, he is extremely, extremely popular here and has the support of the vast majority of Chinese. Before we take a break, and we do need to take a break, I want to ask you one last thing about China. I'd like, I'd like to know how the Chinese feel about Donald Trump. How does the man in the street feel about Donald Trump? Are we going to go to the break now, or you want me to ask for that? Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we do it as a cliffhanger, Marco? You can, <laughs> you can think about that and how you're going to formulate a really powerful answer. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back, and we'll hear your answer. Hi, I'm Chris Leatham with The Economy and You, and I'd like to invite you each week to come watch my show each Wednesday at 3 p.m.
Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki from Life in the Law on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm delighted to tell everybody, I'm so excited, I'm going to Washington to march with women on Saturday, January 21st. It's going to be a huge, huge event. And I think we're doing something in Hawaii too, aren't we? Yes, we are here on Oahu. We're going to be at the Capitol uh, starting at 8 a.m. We're back. We're live. We are enjoying our Thursday afternoon with Marco Mangelsdorf, who joins us from slightly chilly Shanghai <laughs> by Skype audio. We are so pleased to be able to talk to him uh, at this distance from the perspective of someone traveling away from Hawaii for a little while. So let's finish the cliffhanger, Marco. Uh, what do the Chinese feel about Donald Trump? Well, by all reports, they have uh, been asking... Uh, many, many questions uh, through their interlocutors as far as uh, both in the government level and the commercial level to asking their, their various American contacts, who is this guy? Does he really mean what he say? What is it going to mean for Chinese-American relations? So uh, understandably, they're intensely, intensely curious because they'd like to get a, a read of the guy, or have wanted to get a read of the guy before he actually assumes office in a number of hours. And I have to, to believe, and, and this is also very apparent in court, in, according to the, the media commentary that I've been reading in a number of publications, is that there is a high level of concern uh, that if, in fact, Mr. Trump is going after what are perceived as core Chinese interests, of which, of course, Taiwan is the top of the list, then there's been some mention of the, quote, the gloves coming off. But beyond that metaphor of gloves coming off, there's been no, nor should there be, in my opinion, any specific mention of possible specific retaliation. But uh, I can tell you this, I mean, the folks of the party and the government in Beijing have been analyzing this now since November 9th and Mr. Trump's election uh, success uh, in terms of uh, the escalation ladder as far as if the Americans do A, B, then we do X, Y. So uh, I'm sure they, they will be ready. But it's, uh, as I said earlier, I mean, there's no more important bilateral relationship on the planet than between Beijing and Washington. And I can only hope that on both sides, cool heads will prevail. There's been a lot of concern here, Jay mentioned in the press, about a trade war. And that, I think, would be uh, very, very bad news for not only both countries, but for, for the rest of the, the world as well. Yeah, nobody wins on that, really. So let's turn to, uh, let's turn to, um, let's turn to energy. Let's turn to energy in Hawaii. Now, you wrote an article recently about the condition of solar here. Um, why don't you summarize that article for us, and then we can talk about it. Well, my piece in the Civil Bee was essentially uh, what I called uh, you know, Hawaii, the state of solar, the state of solar in Hawaii. And I've been doing kind of an annual review over the, uh, these past five years, looking back in, in the rearview mirror to the previous year, kind of taking stock on where where we are as a, an industry in terms of uh, affordable takes across the state of Hawaii. And I was particularly struck by the very ambitious and bold goals that were uh, spelled out in the Hawaii electric, uh, Hawaiian Electric Power Supply Improvement Plans to have dramatic increases of rooftop solar just in the next five years, in, in what they call the near term, from seven, 19, excuse me, 2017 to 20 to the end of 2021. And I was really struck by these bold and ambitious numbers in light of the fact that 2016 was the worst year on record in terms of my record, our record keeping of PV permits across the state going back over the past five or six years, the worst year on record as far as the number of PV permits issued in 2016 compared to the previous five years. So here these bold goals are being uh, enunciated by Hawaiian Electric, and yet the numbers in 2016 were going in the very opposite direction. So I chewed on that in terms of what are some of the reasons behind that, what we can expect, and just uh, kind of overall, I don't know if I'd say the irony, but uh, the uh, the different parallel parallel alternate realities between what's being discussed at a, at a high falluting level, as I called it, uh, by the state in terms of whether we reach 100% uh, renewable energy and power generation by 2045 or 2040 or 2035, I mean, 
regardless of what number you want to pick of the three I just said, is still decades away. And I'm much more concerned as a business owner, and obviously with a vested interest as a business owner in rooftop solar, I'm much more concerned in the next six to 36 months, now what's going to happen decades from now. So that was kind of the overall gist of my piece is that the numbers that I'm seeing, despite the, 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 the rosy sounding rhetoric from people who are not in this industry, uh, that I just saw a real disconnect. So, you know, in a nutshell, that was the gist of my piece. Well, it's, it's very interesting, and I think it's very appropriate. And the question to me is, so if we have a rosy picture and we have goals that are even more proximate than 2045, um, is there a discussion of exactly how we achieve that? How do we, you know, resuscitate the solar ins installation industry? How do we make it all come together and get on the track and, and start moving with alacrity forward? <clears throat> Was that discussed? Well, uh, how can I answer that? I mean, you had a chair of the PC. Mr. Randy Iwasa on your show not too long ago, and I actually was able to watch that. I forget where I was exactly. I could have been in Vietnam, perhaps. This is just a couple weeks ago, I think. And um, Mr. Iwasa uh, uh, alluded to, and he's, he's, he made the same comment, he's made the same comment in the past, that essentially uh, getting to these uh, high percentages of renewable energy it does not center around the photovoltaic industry, it does not center around rooftop solar. Rooftop solar is not the be-all and end-all. Now, I'm paraphrasing what he said because he didn't actually use those words. But, and, and I agree that the focus should not be exclusively, of course, on rooftop solar, just because I and my colleagues and my competitors are focusing on this line of business and this technology doesn't mean that the sole focus should be on us. I've never, never argued that. So the question is, what kind of mix are we going to have, Jay, mm -hmm. right. when it comes to providing, getting to the magic goal of 100% renewable energy and power generation? What, what's the mix going to be between centralized versus decentralized? Yes. And this is, going to, this is going to be an ongoing debate and discussion and argument in the decades, to, in, the, in the years to come. And I don't know what the right balance is or should be, but I have been in this field now for going on 40 years and I happen to believe that there is a simplicity and elegance and a significant value on allowing individuals and businesses to be able to have their own semi-independent little power plants on their roof. I've always liked that idea but at the same time I realized that traditionally the cost of those systems on a kilowatt hour uh, cost kilowatt hour generated basis, uh, the, the smaller the system, the more expensive the, the solar power produced. So, I mean, you know, case in point, my friends at KIUC announced just uh, a week or 10 days ago the, the sixth or seventh, I think it is, utility scale PV project that they're doing, which will be cheaper than any other project has ever been done mm -hmm. in the state in terms of 11 cents a kilowatt hour mm -hmm. with battery storage, working with a company based in Virginia, if I'm not mistaken, AES. It, it shows AES, you what can be done, yeah. It, sh it shows what can be done. So we shouldn't, I think, you know, go whole hog on either centralized utility scale solar at, to the detriment of rooftop solar, nor should we go in the other direction either. So th the question is, the challenge is finding the balance. And then you've got this wild card of community solar, which has so much buzz and hoopla about it but is, is a long time in the making. So when community solar is actually going to come into play, when the first community solar system will actually be installed and in producing power, I mean, who knows when that's going to be? I mean, look how long it took GEMS to get on board, and look, look at all the flack that the GEMS oh, program GEMS, GEMS has, done has anything. attracted. GEMS is a failure, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, I guess the question, I, I go back to the original question, and that is how are we going to do it? And I guess what that means is how are we going to, uh, you know, make this economic for people, attract them, incentivize them, uh, help them pay for it. Uh, both, uh, both sides of the coin, on rooftop solar and also on business solar, and government solar, on government buildings. I mean, how, how do you achieve that? Who decides the percentage? Who decides the relative incentivization? Um, and, I, and I guess what I hear you saying is that, A, it's not decided. Um, B, it, hopefully one day it will be decided. But I don't hear who will decide it. 
uh, for that matter, I don't hear the factors by which it would be decided. Um, what do you think, Marco? Well, the players, of course, are is the, the main regulatory body, the Public Utilities Commission, and, and two of what I call the two power, two of the four uh, power dockets, I'll call them. One is the Distributed Energy Resources Docket, or DER Docket. The other is the Power Supply Improvement Plan. The disposition of those two dockets will play a major role in establishing what the mix is going to be in the years to come. The legislature will continue to, to try to be involved. I just read recently, the past day or so, that there is a bill or two that seeks to have us become 100% renewable in transportation. Well, you know, rot's a ruck. Uh, you know, it's nice that at least we're talking about that more. But uh, to what extent the legislature can be an active, uh, you know, certainly they have a seat at the table, but I, I see this happening mostly in the regulatory realm. Uh, and it's not just, of course, the three commissioners, uh, Mr. Gorak, Ms. Akiba, and Mr. Awase, who are, are the three commissioners right now, but it's also the various uh, energy stakeholders for these dockets, from the consumer advocate to other interested parties that all have a say. So it's going to be a collaborative effort, and I can only hope that they reach something that's actionable and implementable sooner rather than later, because if, if this dawdling, no, I don't want to say dawdling, if, if the process as it typically unfolds on these dockets uh, unfolds at the, the usual pace, then I am very, very concerned, and I've been saying this for months and months, that there may not be much of a local solar electric industry mm -hmm at the end of all this discussion. Two, two thoughts before we go, Marco. Uh, one, one is, uh, you know, it uh, seems to me um, that the legislature has got to put its money where its mouth is. Um, it's got to do incentives. Incentives do change the way uh, people conduct their business, their lives. Uh, and if you offer incentives, uh, incentives for transportation, for, for cars, you'll have more than 5,000 cars out of a million cars which we need to increase that number. Um, but at the same time, you, you read, of course, that we have, failed to, uh, we have failed to fund the employee's retirement system to the tune now of $12 billion. We owe that money. Uh, we have another you know, 10 or more billion on rail. We are going to owe that money. Uh, we are not a rich state. And frankly, it looks like we're getting to be a poorer state. So if you want to have billions of dollars of incentives, um, you know, there may be no money for that. Uh, the other thing I want to offer as, as we go, uh, you know, closing here and, and have you make a comment on it, is the possibility that since there are two sides to the coin in solar, one is the, is the traditional side of solar installers putting solar on rooftops for customers and single family residences and all that. The other side is the, is the utility side. And I, I'm always wondering why the utility cannot use um, have the benefit of all these installers with all their expertise and their sources of supply and so forth. Uh, why, why doesn't the utility hire the same installers who do the rooftop work to do large-scale projects in solar? Wouldn't that keep the industry busy? Wouldn't it keep the industry viable? Why don't we do that? Why doesn't say, somebody say something about that? What do you say about that? Well, I say that uh, I've been uh, either part of the HEI family or an observer uh, over the past, going on 17 years now, Jay, and I know that Hawaiian Electric uh, at the highest levels has, has thought about and considered very seriously to what, to what degree to, to have they wanted to get involved in actual project development and actually kind of boots on the ground. And uh, ultimately... You know, my impression is that they, they've shied away from going in that direction in terms of being more actively involved with actually installing PV capacity on the ground. So, uh, you know, the, amongst many of the stakeholders, a number of the stakeholders, the energy and dynamic between them and Hawaiian Electric is, shall I say, not the best, not the warmest, not the most cooperative. And uh, I don't want to overstate that, but at the same time, it'd be, I'd be foolish if I just ignored it. So I'll wrap it up this way, just kind of as a means of comparison. I mean, we've got enormous challenges in Hawaii. Uh, we live in a beautiful place. Typically, the water is clean to drink out of the tap. The air, aside from the fog being yucky, 
on certain days uh, is, is, is good to breathe. And we've come a long way. We live in a beautiful place. And the challenges before us, I think, are not insurmountable by any means. And compare that to where I am here now, where I just read a recent report that of the 338 cities in China last year, 80% of them, 80% representing probably close to a billion people, the, the air quality was substandard by Chinese standards, by Chinese standards. So the challenge that the Chinese government and the party have in terms of cleaning up the environment here that's a, that negatively affects hundreds of millions of Chinese is is infinitely more difficult and more challenging than our little the challenges uh, that we have to become more energy independent in, in beautiful Hawaii. Thank you, Margaret. That does put it in perspective. Uh, we should continue this conversation when you're back, or at least in a couple of weeks. Uh, and, uh, well, hurry home and let's talk some more. Thank you, Marco. Thank you so much, Jay. The next time in uh, Luang Prabang, uh, Lao, People Democratic Republic, if we can swing that, you and I, the two of us. There you go. Xie Xie, Sai Jin, Xin Yin Kuai Le.